Okay. So tithing, like we said last week, is not a major theme in the New Testament for a number of reasons. Okay. I still a number of reasons. Let me look for them to see if I can. That's okay. So he keeps writing. Leave will soon be. Leave will soon be. My leave will soon finish. Okay, we said this is it, that tithe was not a major theme in the New Testament. This is why we gave some reasons why uh, that was so. We gave some reasons why that was so. One of them is because the law and its ordinances were not in effect, all right? in the New Testament, since they were all fulfilled. Number two, the doctrine of merit by work, okay, is not a feature of grace, of the grace of Christ Jesus. So I'm trying to answer your question that says that if you don't give tight, you will go to, you will not go to heaven. Then if that's the case, then you are subscribing to, to faith by works. But according to Ephesians 2, 8, it's not by works, it's by faith. All right, so tight does not guarantee you heaven whatsoever. We are told in John, uh, Romans, in fact, John, uh, 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 as many as believed him, he gave them power to become sons. Uh, uh, he says, uh, Romans 10, 9 and 10, if you uh, believe in your heart, confess with your mouth, you shall be saved. So these are the things that make for salvation and not the fact that you pay tithe or you give tithe or not. Okay? All right? Now, I think the logical question then will be, so why are we teaching it, right? So why are we teaching it? First of all, then you must, we might as well ask the same question of any other doctrine that is not directly related to salvation, but we teach it anyway, like service. Like service. Why do we teach service? Romans 12, I beseech you by the message of God, you present your body as a living sacrifice, which is your a reasonable act of service. Why do we teach service if it is not directly related to my salvation? We teach these things because they are part of kingdom culture. There is what we call kingdom culture. Giving is part of kingdom culture. Are you understanding? Giving is part of kingdom culture. And what I'm trying to achieve in this teaching is to dissuade your mind from separating, tithing, from giving or offering. Tithe, your tithe is only a little portion of your givings. Are you understanding? Your tithe is only a little portion of your givings. Okay? The reason why tithe has dominated the giving sphere is because of the problem of abuse. And we addressed the problem of abuse last week. We acknowledged that there is so much abuse when it comes to uh, resources in the church. And uh, the, the victim that is always pointed to is the tithe because of the notion we have had that the tithes are given to the preachers or the men of God or the Levites because that's what we've been preached to. And I took time to show you the three categories of tithes all right, you remember that we have the tithe for the Levi, the Levite, the Levitical tithe. Then we have what I call the household tithe, which is given every year, once every year. 
Then we have the Congregational or Festive Tide, which is once every three years. Remember when Malachi chapter 10 says, bring the tithe into my storehouse, it was referring to the third category of tithe, which was to take care of widows, which were to take care of orphans, which was to take care of their fatherless. That was a tithe that was being referred to when he says, bring the tithes into my storehouse. That's the context of that Malachi scripture. Are you understanding? So we address the concept of abuse. We acknowledge that there is abuse, all right? Where we give examples, we know men of God who they came from nothing, but suddenly <laughs> it become uh, these flashy uh, persons. And it's obvious that it is from the givings from the church. Hallelujah. That does not stop the institution of giving or the, uh, the, the kingdom culture of giving. That does not make it evil. All right, so why am I teaching it? I'm teaching it because it is part one. It is part of kingdom culture. Two, because of the misconception that tithing was not practiced in the New Testament. So I'm here to educate you that we have evidence that Jesus commanded tithing. I showed you in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 13 and 14. That Jesus commanded tithe, and I took time to show you all that and reference all that. Today, I would like to show you that the Apostle Paul actually hinted on tithing, hinted on tithing. In fact, he asked the people uh, to gather their money and that he's coming for it. I will show you that. Any other question before we proceed? It's someone else will ask. Uh, Any others before we proceed? Sorry, sir. Um, please, I, I have a question. Is it clear? Hello, sir. All right, then. Let's get to it. Uh, so, oh, quick uh, recap. Right. Someone is trying to ask a question. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry, sir. Please, can you hear me? No, I can hardly hear. Why can't I hear? Okay, go ahead. All right. All right. So, so, sir, I, I was, I was asking. Um, I hear, I hear a lot of um arguments out there, and one of such arguments I hear is um, okay. So, citing, citing what according to some of the scriptures you gave us last week, according to Numbers eighteen twenty one to twenty four, it was. God's way of remunerating the um the priests or the Levites because he didn't give them an inheritance because he asked them not to have an inheritance and that was his way of remunerating them so that they would man the tents they would be the custodians of the tents so that nobody so you read that scripture you realize that he says nobody no Israelite should come close to the tent or else they be consumed in their sin fast forward Matthew twenty seven fifty one the Bible says that. Jesus Christ died and all that happened. And then the veil in the Holy of Holies is torn. And then we all have come to understand the spiritual implications of the veil being torn, which means that we all now have access to it. It's not somebody leading us anymore. Mm -hmm. My question said then is, if the, then in the Old Testament, the, 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 the duty of the Levite or the priest was to man the tent so that I don't come close and be consumed in my sin. And now the act of Jesus Christ has opened that doorway and has given me the chance to go without the priest being the, the lead, playing the lead role in that. Why should I continue paying tithe? Because the tithe was supposed to, you know, be their way of God's way of remunerating them for what they were doing. Mm -hmm. Why should I continue to pay when they are no longer doing that the job they, they were supposed to do then? Okay. All right. Uh, it's a good question. Very interesting. And that that is the mindset with which this tithing is attacked or is dealt with. And that's why I'm building point by point to 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 uh, discontinue that mindset. First of all, it's not only the tithe alone that fed the Levites. It was not the tithe alone. It was all the offering types that I show you, six categories of offerings under the, under the uh, 
the compulsory uh, offerings and then the free will offerings three times. All these fed the, the Levites. Okay, first of all, so it's not the tithe only that fed the Levites. Okay, number one. Number two, that the veil being torn and making all of us priests and kings. That is in a spiritual sense. All right? That's, it's, it, that's in a spiritual sense. So uh, uh, that, that doesn't mean that because the veil is torn, there are no more uh, uh, servants who are dedicated solely to the work of God. We see that in, in the book of Acts chapter 2, I believe. Remember when there was chaos in the first church and Peter then said, you know, let me tell you, let, this, is, this is my thought about it. Peter and those guys began to implement the new order of things, but they found out quickly that it is not sustainable. What do I mean? They began to indulge themselves because since you see the mindset you have, the priest is no more there, the temple is no more there. So we all can partake in this duty and we all can do it. They realized quickly that it was not sustainable. So Peter came and said, we will now go back to the dedicated duty of the priest. Even though, of course, he did not say it that way. We will, not go, we will now go back to the dedicated duty of praying and giving ourselves to the study of the word. So Peter reinstituted that office of them being dedicated to this office. Are you following? Are you following? So the veil was torn, making everybody king, uh, kings and priests. But the duty of dedication to the service of God, Peter instituted it. You know the scripture I'm talking about, or should we read it? Let's read it since we're recording uh, for context, okay? Acts chapter 6, actually. Acts chapter 6, verse it's in Acts chapter 6. Yes, Acts chapter 6, verse 4. Let's take a look at it. Okay, uh, let's read from verse, we know the story, so let's not go back too far. Let's read from verse three, all right? See what the Bible says. Give me time, let me share it on the screen. Message translation. It says, so friends, choose seven men from among you who, whom everyone trusts, men full of the Holy Spirit and good sense, and will assign them this task. Okay, so Peter, who came from that background of free, everything is free, everybody can partake, everybody can partake. They found out quickly that this system is not sustainable. And one of the systems that people talk about in, in, the, in the first century church, which I also thought was, I, in fact, it proved that it's not sustainable, is that Christians selling their stuff and bringing to the house of God is not sustainable. They found out quickly that that was also not sustainable. People sold their items and brought it to the house of God. If everybody sell their item and brought it to the house of God, what happens when everybody's goods finish? Then what? The church becomes poor. It's not sustainable, right? So two things were not sustainable in the first century church. The fact that everybody can do the work of God and there are no dedicated people. So you won't give tithe or you won't give uh, offerings or to those people to take care of them. So Peter quickly recognizes that and then says in verse 4, look at verse 4. Meanwhile, we will stick to our assigned task of prayer and speaking God's word. Did you hear that? So in Acts chapter 6 verse 4, Peter reinstituted the office of a dedicated minister, which were the priests and the Levites in the Old Testament. Are you following? Are you following? All right. So... Having this is the second, this is the second point. All right, the second answer to your to your question. Now, to show that this was practiced, 
we go now to 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 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 9, verse 13. Let's read from context. Let's read from verse 1. Watch. Message says, and don't tell me that I have no authority to write like this. I am perfectly free to do this. Isn't that obvious? Haven't I been given the job to do? Wasn't I commissioned to the work in a face-to-face -face meeting with Jesus, our master? Aren't you yourself proof of the good work that I've done for the master? Verse 2, even if no one else admits my authority, uh, uh, authority of my commission, you can deny it. Why? My work with you is living proof. It says, I am not shy in standing up to my critics. Uh, all right, so verse six. Now let's read verse, let's read verse, verse four. We who are on missionary assignment for God have a right to decent accommodation. So, so look at his, the task he has defined, missionaries, on assignment. Are there dedicated people in this our time who are only dedicated to the work of God? Are there? Hello? Are there people like that? Yeah, there are. So Paul says, we who are on missionary assignment for God have a right. So you see, I told you, Paul calls this a right. There is no argument about it. It's a right. Why is he calling it a right? He will tell us later. And we have a right to support for our, for us and our families. You don't seem to have raised questions with other apostles and our master's brother. Look at that. And Peter in these matters. Okay, why did I bring you here? I brought you here to show you that Peter instituted the office of a dedicated priesthood, which brought back the Levitical order that was abrogated because of the so-called uh, uh, tearing of the curtain. All right? Peter reinstituted it, starting from himself. Do you see that? So Paul now picks on that and says that, they, you have no question about that. Why are you raising a question about me? Verse 6. So why me? Is it just Barnabas and I who have to go eat alone and pay our own way? All right. Our soldiers, blah, blah, blah. Now jump all the way to verse 13. Uh, the... Okay, jump, jump to verse 13. Verse 13, look at that. This is very important, look at that. All I'm concerned with right now is that you do not use our decision to take advantage of others, depriving them of what is rightly theirs. So I like the way message puts it. Paul says that we made a decision not to take, not to be a burden on you people by you, by allowing you to feed us, allowing you to provide for us. That does not mean we don't have a right to it. We have right to it. But do not use our decision as a measuring tool for the system. So what is happening is that people who argue that what you have raised say that every man of God should be working and not dependent on the church. That's not what the system says. Paul says that the fact that I have made that decision you should not use that as a measuring tool. But that is what is done now. Paul's decision is used as a measuring tool for other pastors to say that, look at Paul, look at Barnabas. He was a worker, but still doing mission. Sir, that is not an institution. Uh, Peter instituted it and told us this is how it's supposed to be. And they ran it. How do we know it was run? Because Paul says that they did not question it in verse 5. In verse 5, he says they did not question it until he came and they started questioning it. Are you following me, please? Are you following? So he says, uh, I'm reading from here. You know, don't you, 
that it's always been taken for granted that those who work in the temple live off the proceeds of the temple and that those who offer sacrifices at the altar eat their meals from what has been sacrificed. So I told you last week that Paul, verse 13, is Paul appealing to an Old Testament law to justify what is currently going on in the first century church. Please, are you following? Then the verse 14, he says, along the same lines, the master directed that those who spread the message be supported by those who believe the message. Now, this thing, verse 14 is very, very crucial. This is proof that Jesus Christ actually said, you people should support those who are dedicated for the work of God. These are Jesus' words. Paul is quoting and saying that the master directed. So I try to push uh, and make you guys, let's read it in NLT and see, and see. In the same way, the Lord ordered, he did not suggest, it was actually an order. The Lord ordered that those who preach the good news should be supported by those who benefit from it. Please, are you following? So the argument that says that uh, since the veil is torn, there is no need. The question is, do we have men who are dedicated to spreading the gospel who don't do any secular work? Are there people like that? If there are people like that, Jesus has expressly ordered and commanded in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 14. Paul is reporting this to us. And I told you my, my speculation about how Paul is reporting this because he said he went to see James. He went to see the apostles. And that is where most likely he saw the practice and he told him that this was how missionaries were supposed to be taken care of. So there is no, there is no, uh, uh, confusion when it comes to the order of, of administration and taking care of men of God in the first century. Church. There was no confusion about it. Jesus clearly made that system. He built the system before he left. You know, I used to think that, I used to think that Jesus actually did not put up structures, all right, before he died. But then I found out that when he resurrected, he was with the people for 40 days. The Bible says he was instructing them. So I believe that it was that 40 days he, he was with them that he instructed them in these things. Proof is 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 14. Paul tells us the Lord commanded. When did the Lord command? I suppose within those 40 days, that is when Jesus Christ put in some, some of these structures. Amen. All right. Somebody's raising their hand. Uh, Rosebell, please ask. And then Joshua, you can ask your follow-up question if you do. But do you understand so far the argument I've made to answer your question? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. All right. Yes, sir. Please. Um, and then it leads me straight into the next one. So, sir, mm -hmm. my next question then is, I, I keep hearing things like, have you been called into full-time ministry? And I ask myself, which one is full-time ministry? Because then the, the, the responses are like, full-time ministry is just like you're teaching us you are dedicated to without doing any other work. Some people also prefer that I don't want to be a burden to people, so I want to work. So, sir, is there any biblical, uh, 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 something biblical about what we call, what we are now calling full-time ministry and what is a part-time ministry? Is there anything biblical about it? And if there is, what, what are the differences? How do we maneuver through these things? Okay. Uh, Paul, again, is an example of what is called lay ministry. The, the name is lay ministry, lay, lay ministry. Lay ministry is someone who serves in, in church, who has dedicated themselves for service, uh, you know, but works a secular job, like Paul, like Barnabas, all right? And then we have the Peters, we have the Jameses, who are clergy, all right, clergy, and the, 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 the assignment is clear. They've dedicated themselves to prayer and study the, studying the word of God. In fact, 
When you go to Israel now, like I told you, there are there are those who, in fact, the government pays them to study the Torah. Now, they don't do any other work. They are paid to just read the Torah and study the Torah. And they are very comfortable. All right. So, so there is that office. So we have what we call the lay ministry, where someone is still at uh, uh, doing doing a secular job and dedicated his life to serving God. Like me, I'm not a full time pastor. I'm a typical example of a lay pastor. All right, a lay pastor. Now, in that sense, it is left to the local administration of the church, how to handle lay ministers. What is clear in scripture is that if there are clergy, dedicated people in the church who are serving as pastors, preachers, ministers, bishops, like uh, we see what is called full-time ministry, then there is a, a layout rule for them to be taken care of by the church, we have we have we have not seen any administration around lay ministers. All right, so that is left to the local church on how to handle lay ministers. And I believe one of the classic examples of lay ministry uh, and handling them would be in the Lighthouse Church, because uh, Bishop Dak has developed a very sophisticated and comprehensive structure around lay ministry. And for him, he, he encourages a, a lay ministry. So in our church, for example, we do not have uh, such a structure. Even our dedicated pastor, our main pastor, we have uh, our head pastor, Pastor Ferd, as at the last time I knew he was not being taken care of by the church. The simple reason is that the church did not have the muscle to take care of the church, uh, to, to take care of the man of God. So, so it depends. If, if the church grows to a point where they can take care of the man of God and take care of administrative stuff and take care of volunteers, why not? Right? Why not? Okay. But like I said, once again, all this is coming out because of the problem of abuse. The problem of abuse. I mean, you see the, the 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 general overseer who owns a Bentley, who owns uh, several properties, and you can still see certain members of the church trying to find their feet, and this brings concern uh, to most people. So it, these these are genuine concerns. I hope your question has been answered. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. All right. Well, so for example, when we go to uh, 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 certain ministries like uh, uh, we call them support ministries like the choir like uh, instrumentalists if the church is in a position to keep and support those people why not uh, 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 Nathaniel Bassi is a classic example of how his pastor told him to come focus on music and he would take care of him you know and, and look at where he is now there are churches that have their 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 choir on uh, on 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 paycheck salaries. If the church is in the position to do that, why not? Amen. All right, Pastor Roosevelt. Hello. Um. Uh. Maybe you may have tackled that question, but uh, uh, I was thinking about like, for example, as uh, when you get salary, we already know that it's ten percent of the salary, mm -hmm. and we give it a tithe. All right. Uh, but I have been wondering, are there monies that we are supposed to tithe and not tithe? For example, me personally, if I receive 500 from someone as a gift, I quickly put my 10% of that 500 as a tithe, regardless. Okay. But now there are questions like, uh, for example, you start a business with a uh, thousand and you make a profit of a hundred. So the total is 1100. Do you tithe ten percent of eleven hundred, or should you tithe ten percent of the hundred that you made as a profit? Okay. And uh, yeah, go ahead. Lastly, for something like loan, because uh, when when I used to take loan, I used to tithe my ten percent of the entire loan. Uh, you understand? For example, sometimes let's say it's a top up, 
uh, let's say I top up a loan and out of the top up, I only get 15,000. So I will tithe one five of that loan. But I realize that I will still continue paying my 10% of my salary, despite the fact that it's cutting off my loan. Mm -hmm. So are there monies we are supposed to tithe and are there monies that we are not supposed to tithe? All right, let me go into today's teaching and I'm sure that will handle this issue in a way and then I'll top up. Now, uh, part two of what we started last week, uh, I ended last week's teaching uh, at the point where I proved, which I reiterated again, that Jesus actually specifically ordered tithing. Now, the argument is that, okay, you look into that scripture and it doesn't say tithing, but I took you, I took time to show you the cross references in Numbers and Deuteronomy, all right, where that reference was being made. Please do you remember, do you remember? Okay, so that institution was in Deuteronomy, uh, I believe, 18, Numbers 16, uh, Leviticus 16, uh, and also in Numbers. I showed you uh, last week. It's in the video. Please check it out. All right? Uh, so so today, I want to show you scripture references to where Paul made a, an allusion to tithing and go into uh, trying to uh, address this. So look at uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 16. 1 Corinthians chapter 16, Paul is talking about making uh, a collection for the church in Jerusalem. Look at what he says. Uh, sorry. Look at that. He's about to address this issue. He says, now regarding your question about the money being collected for God's people in Jerusalem, you should follow the same procedure I gave the church in Galatia. This is very important. That means Paul had instituted some instruction for the people of Galatia to follow. Are you seeing that? So there is a structure in Galatia already that is working. Look at what he says. This is very interesting. On the first day of every week, you should each put aside a portion of money you have earned. Hmm. Hmm. Okay. Do you need a seller moment here? Do you guys need a seller moment here? What does yes. this look like? <laughs> ponder, ponder on that. Yeah, ponder <laughs> on it. Whilst you ponder, let me show you Deuteronomy chapter. Uh, Deuteronomy, give me a minute. <laughs> it is interesting. Deuteronomy 14, 22. Deuteronomy 14, 22. Let's keep, keep your mind on this one. Oh. Mm. And let's go to De Deuteronomy 14, 22. Hmm. Look at it all. You must set aside a tithe of your crop. One tenth of all the crop you have harvest, you harvest each year. The key word is set aside. Is Paul borrowing this word from somewhere? Hello, hello, hello. Deuteronomy concerning the tithe, he says, you must set it aside. Set aside. Forget about the word tithe. Let's focus on the word set aside. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 16, 2. On the first day of each week, you should do what? Set aside, put aside a portion of the money. Hello, people of God. <laughs> Isn't this interesting? So, whilst we are talking about paying tight once a month, once a year, once three years, Paul actually says it should be every week. 
Okay, the argument here is that he's not talking about tithing. Well, well, well. Do you need to do uh 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 what is the name of that uh quantum physics to know that what is referring to which other offering do you set aside which which other offering among the offerings that we talked about is there any that other offering that you were supposed to set aside that's why i showed you deuteronomy chapter 14 verse 22 the only offering that was supposed to be set aside was the tithe so if Paul in the New Testament is saying, set aside a portion of money. Hmm. Now, the next question is, why did he not say tithe? That is very important. That's very important. The reason is this. The reason Paul, let's read on. Let's read on, okay? So, on the first day of each week, you should each put aside a portion of your money you have earned. Don't wait until I get there and then try to collect it all at once. When I come, I will write letters of recommendation for the messengers you choose to deliver to, uh, to deliver your gift to Jerusalem. And if it seem appropriate for me to go along, they and travel with me. I am coming to visit you after I have been to Macedonia. All right. Um, let's jump. Okay, let's continue reading what I forget. Perhaps I will stay with you, possibly all in winter, and then uh, can send me, you can send me on my way to my next destination. This phrase is very important. You can send me on my way. Paul is, is insinuating that when he comes, he will not be the one to sponsor his trip. You will send me on my way. You are going to sponsor my trip and send me on my way. Is this clear? Can you see that? He said, you can send me on my way. It's, it's telling you that when I come and I'm going, I will not pay for my own trip. You would have to send me on my way. Is that clear? <laughs> it says, this time, I don't want to make just a short visit and then go right on. I want to come and stay a while if the Lord let me. In the meantime, I will be staying here at Ephesus until the Festival of Pentecost. All right, there is a wide open door, uh, although there are positions. Uh, when Timothy comes, don't intimidate him. He's doing the Lord's job just as I am. Um, don't let anyone treat him uh, with content. Send him on his way. Another one, send him on his way with your blessing. When he returns to me, I expect him to come with other believers. Now, about our brother Apollos, I urge him to visit you, uh, blah, 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 yada, yada, yada. Um, uh, 14, do everything with love. I'm looking for a scripture. Uh, all right. So I wanted to answer to you. I'll show you the scripture. I wanted to answer to you why I believe Paul did not add the word tithe to it. Because in the New Testament, we are not restricted to a tenth. Okay, I'm looking for the scripture to show you. We are not restricted to a tenth. We are encouraged to give generously. Are you, are you following me? Let me see if I have it. All right. We are encouraged to do what? Give generously. All right, this is the verse. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6 to 8. 2 Corinthians, let's read it. 
Second Corinthians, give me some minutes. All right, let's read from verse one. Paul speaking again. I don't really need to write to you about this ministry of giving for the believers in Jerusalem. It's the same subject. Are you here? Now, for I know how eager you are to help. And I have been boasting to the churches in Macedonia that you in Greece were ready to send an offering a year ago. In fact, it was your enthusiasm that stirred up many of the Macedonian believers to begin to give. But I, I am sending these brothers to you before you really, you really are ready, as I have been telling them, and that your money is uh, all collected. I don't want to be wrong in my boasting about you. We would be embarrassed, not to mention your own embarrassment, if some Macedonian believers came with me and found that you were you aren't ready after all. I had told them, so I thought I should send uh, uh, send these brothers ahead of ahead of me to make sure the gift you promise is ready. But I want you to be willing. To be a willing, it, I want it to be a willing gift. Hear that? Not one giving grudgingly. This is the key. In the New Testament, the reason we are not the what I'm what I'm trying to say is there was no definition to what you give. There was no uh, definition is not the right word. There was no measure to what you give. This is why. Because you are supposed to give it willingly. All right? And not give it grudgingly. It says, remember this. A farmer who plants only a few seeds will get a, will get a small crop. But the one who plants generously will get generously. You must eat, decide in your heart how much to give. Now, woman of God, this will answer your question. The issue of tithing in the New Testament is a personal revelation. It is not a tenth. So if you decide in your heart that whatever money I get, I will give a portion of it. It could be a tenth. It could be a twentieth. It could be a fiftieth. It don't matter. In the New Testament, the, 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 the limit of a tenth is taken away. That's the difference of tithing in the New Testament. The limit of a tenth is taken away. You must each decide in your heart how to give it. So in the New Testament, how you give your tithe is your personal prerogative. And that applies to every other offering. Now, I taught you before that the tithe is only an offering. So this includes your tithing, your 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 seed whatever offering you give you decide how to give it and don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure for god loves a cheerful giver i would have you to know that if you give your tithe grudgingly or with pain i would have you to know that there is no reward in it it's painful. I will have you know that there is no reward in it. Did I show you that scripture? That's principle. Oh, Jesus. Hmm. Let me show you. Uh, let me show you quickly. Look at that. First Corinthians nine seventeen. <laughs> okay, somebody's asking a question. Uh, let me not forget my train of thought. Let me handle it before. Uh, 1 Corinthians 9, 17. Uh, uh, we have 1 Corinthians 9 here. Let's go to 17. Hmm. 
Hmm. Let me use King James here. Look at that. First Corinthians 9, 17. For if I do this thing willingly, I have a reward. But if I if if against my will, a dispensation of the gospel is just committed to me. Look at it in NLT. If I were doing this on my own initiative, I would deserve payment. But I have no choice, for God has given me this sacred trust. Paul is saying that anything I do under duress, there is no reward for it. But if I do it willingly, voluntarily, I have a reward, an IV. If I preach voluntarily, I have a reward. If not voluntarily, I am simply discharging the trust given to me. So in the New Testament, we are not giving with restriction. We, we've been asked to give voluntarily. So you decide how, when, what you give. So in the New Testament, there is no uh, restriction to structure that it is your loan that you must give a 10% of, or it's only your salary that you must give a 10% of, or it is only this. It does, in the New Testament, it don't matter 10%, 5%, 20%, 100%. It does not matter. What matters is you decide how to give. All that needs to be done is that it must be given willingly. Hello, hello. Are we here? Is it making sense? Yes, sir. Yeah. So, there is no structure. No pastor has the right to tell you. You must give tight on this money, this money, this money, this money. No, you decide. You decide. Someone says, I have decided in my heart, I'm going to give 25% of whatever I earn. That is a personal revelation. The principle here is that you give willingly and voluntarily. Because it is only things you do voluntarily that in the kingdom of God comes with a reward. If you don't do it voluntarily, you are just discharging your duty. Are you people hearing me? So as your answer, your question being answered, it looks like. Yes, sir. Yeah. So you decide in your heart. Don't do it grudgingly. That is your faith. That is your your love expression be it unto you. And guess what? You can choose to give 5%. It don't matter. In the New Testament, it's not about one-tenth. It's not about one-fifth. It's about the fact that you give it willingly. But you must give. Are we, are we understanding something here? I'm showing yes, sir. black and white scriptures. Let's go back to Let's go back to, uh, which one is that? Second Corinthians, first Corinthians 16, two. Okay, on the first day, you should, you should each put aside a portion of the money you have earned. Don't wait until I get there. So I'm saying that Paul hinted at this thing called tithing. It was not referred to a tithing. Why? Because in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, all right, verse 22, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 17. Oh, no, no, not verse 17. 1 Corinthians, uh, 2 Corinthians 9, Nine verse here. Verse seven. All right. First Corinthians nine, seven. You must each decide in your heart how much to give. In the New Testament, you decide how much to give. You decide how to give. And don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure. For God loves a person who gives cheerfully. Verse 8 says, And God will generously provide all you need. Then you will always have everything you need and plenty left over to share with others. All right. So I showed you, Paul did not use set aside a tenth of your offerings or of your earnings. 
He says, set aside some money. Why? Because he says, you must decide how much to give. It don't matter a fifth, a tenth, a hundred. It doesn't matter. It must be decided by you. It must be given cheerfully, willingly, not under duress. Please, is it understood? So the New Testament, it's not about one tenth. It don't matter. It can be a hundredth. It can be a twenty-fifth. It can be one fourth. It doesn't matter. Hallelujah. Amen. Yeah. All right, the hand is up. Yes, sir. Um, thank you, sir. So please, based on um, this scripture you have just um, showed us, I want to find out. You know, sometimes you come to church and it's not as if you are being like you, you, you thought as the last time. It's not as if you are being cajoled or you are being coerced, but you sit and you feel everybody is giving. Yeah, I'm not able to give. So you, you, are, you are pressed within yourself to do something. Would that be out of pressure or it is it, it also falls in the category of giving willingly I, the condition of the heart god knows it's the condition of the heart that matters i remember there was a time in the university all right uh uh, uh there was a, a fundraising that was going on all right and i had this one 10 cities by then it was 10 cities was uh how much a million or something, I don't know. And and I had just received it from my uncle to take care of me. So that the 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 fundraising was going on, and I'm like, oh, I cannot give this. Uh, this is all I have to live on for the semester. Guess what? I was sitting under a tam a, a tarpaulin, and it had rained that week. All right. So when the appeal was going, and I was being stubborn, guess what? The water, the air just blew the water and the water poured on me. I had to stand up and go give that thing. Sometimes it may be just God nudging you to do what you have to do for him to bless you. All right. So the condition of the heart matters. The condition of the heart matters. Many of us, we give because we are, we are ashamed. Now, the way to fix the problem of shyness or being ashamed is to know that your situation will not be like this forever. Today you can give, tomorrow you'll be able to give. Many times I've gone to church and I've not been able to give. And what's helped me is because I know today I'm not able to give, tomorrow I'll be able to give. And you should not feel any bad about that situation. I'm not able to give today, I'll be able to give tomorrow. All right, so so don't be, don't be, the, the condition of the heart matters. It, 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 and God knows the heart. And if you get up and do some, some shakara just to show that uh, you to you are giving, well, that God knows your heart. All right. So I, 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 I want, uh, for me, the way I solve it is that, is to know that it's today that I'm not able to give. Tomorrow I'll give. And know that I don't give in church. I have given many times in church, but today I don't have it. That doesn't change who I am. Hallelujah. Amen. So it's the condition of the heart. All right. Has that been answered? Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. All right. Any other question? Sir, it's more of an observation or a little bit of confusion. All right. Well, you continue to clarify this, but um, there has been this thing of uh, like when you give something, you give a seed, and then there is this. Um, uh, it's I don't know if I should call it really a coercion or what, but is there is this people adding this uh, reference that you should not give something that does not pain you. you should not give something that you know that is so easy to give. Mm. Um. Okay, well, there is the concept of what we call sacrifice, all right? The idea of sacrifice states that what you give must come from a place of pain. That's, the, that's what the word sacrifice means. It is not sacrifice if it is not okay. painful. Correct. Yeah, so I told you the other time, the idea of the altar is that there must be a sacrifice. If you have an altar without a sacrifice, is this, it's not an altar. And if you claim to sacrifice something and that thing 
does not no cost you. It's not sacrifice. So that 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 uh, that sermon or that theology, that doctrine comes from the doctrine of sacrifice. All right. So okay. it is a good. It's a it's a correct doctrine. All right. Whether you feel bad when they say it, it depends on your understanding. Lately, I have felt that it's been quite a while. I gave something that has pained me. Late, has pain, just, yeah, just, yeah. just lately, I've been feeling that. Just lately, I've been feeling that. And the thing that came to my mind, I began to fight is give your phone. I, I bound that voice. Me, I bound it. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Okay, so that's why I say it is a little confusing because because sometimes you personally I would say it is more of a conviction from inside within me that you should give something that pains you. But now that you put it in that way as a sacrifice, then I, it makes more sense. Yes, that's the idea. That's right, the idea. Okay. The word is a sacrifice. And every sacrifice, the, 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 the inherent meaning of sacrifice is that it costs. It's painful. Right? It's not a sacrifice. It's not painful. That's why in relationship, you say you must sacrifice something. You must compromise something. That means it's painful. Right, so that that is where that doctrine comes from, and it is a it's a real doctrine, it's a real uh, 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 idea uh, that we see in the Bible. All right, and and in the realm of the spirit, there is no sacrifice that does not get reward, whether an evil sacrifice or a good sacrifice. In the realm of the spirit, every sacrifice gets rewarded. Every sacrifice, every sacrifice gets rewarded. Every sacrifice gets rewarded. Amen. First Samuel twenty four twenty four. Uh, let's read it. Uh, if that's Second Samuel, yes, yeah, Second Samuel twenty four twenty four. But the king replied to Aru, Arona, "No, I insist on buying it, for I will not present burnt offering to the Lord my God that have." that have uh, my God that have cost me nothing. So David paid him 50 pieces. All right. So that is the idea of, of an offering. And look at that. He just said an offering. So for me, an offering must cost me something. Right. All right. Uh, let's begin to round up. Uh, now the fathers of faith, huh, the fathers of faith give tithe. The fathers of the gift, Hebrews 12, 1. It says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, and the context there is that there are this group of people who have gone before us, right, and have lived this life before, and they are encouraging us on. One of them is Abraham, and Abraham paid, gave tithe, actually not paid, he gave tithe. Now, I discovered recently that actually Abraham is a Christian, not a Jew. Let me show you. I was, I was, I was so, uh, so excited when I saw that. John chapter 8, verse 56. Look at it. Abraham was a Christian, not a Jew. John 8, what? 56. John is 56. Let's read from. Let's read from 52. The people said, now we know you are possessed by a demon because. Uh, let me share my screen. Now we know you are possessed by a demon because uh, demon. Even Abraham and the prophets died, but you say anyone who obeys my teaching will never die. Are you greater than our father Abraham? He died, and so did the prophets. Who do you think you are? Now Jesus replied, "If I want my, I want glory for myself. It doesn't count." But it is my father who will glorify me. You say he is our God. But you don't even know him. I know him. 
if I said otherwise, I would be as great a liar as you. But I do know him and obey him. Your father, look at that, look at that. Your father, Abraham, rejoiced as he looked forward to my coming. Take it easy here, take it easy. Abraham was looking forward to the coming of Jesus. In fact, he went on to say that he saw it and he was glad. The first Christian was Abraham. In fact, Abraham followed Jesus. Abraham, look, he saw my day and he was glad. Let's read in an IV. Here he's in red. Your father Abraham rejoiced at the at the, at the thought of seeing my day. He saw it and was glad. In fact, before we met Jesus, Abraham had seen Jesus, had encountered Jesus, and was glad that he met the Messiah. The first Christian ever lived that was Abraham. Who then is a Christian? Isn't that a Christian a follower of Christ Jesus? Think about it. Hello, hello. Are you people here? Isn't a Christian a follower of Christ Jesus? Isn't other aren't Christians those who look forward to the coming of the Messiah, the return of, 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 of Jesus? He says, your father Abraham rejoiced at the thought of seeing my day. In fact, he saw it and was glad. When I saw that, I said, I've been reading this scripture for a long time. Wow! Abraham is a Christian. Abraham is a Christian. And when did he see the day of Jesus? Genesis chapter 14. He saw the day of Jesus in Melchizedek. My God. Are you people here tonight? Are you people here tonight? He saw, Abraham saw the day of Jesus when he met Melchizedek. Why? Because the Bible tells us later that Melchizedek is in the order of Jesus Christ. In fact, it is said that Melchizedek is a type of Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So the first Christian that ever lived was Abraham. No wonder that our faith as Christian is, is carved after his faith. Hello? Are you here tonight? It was so thrilling when I discovered this. John chapter 8, verse 56. There, Abraham, Jesus, in fact, Jesus is the one telling us who? Jesus is the one telling us that Abraham saw him. So anyone who saw and believed in Jesus Christ is who? He's a Christian. He's a follower of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. And he gave tithe. It was when he was giving the tithe to Melchizedek. That is when Jesus was revealed to him. So that tells me this thing called tithing and giving is very important. Amen. So the fathers of faith gave tithe. Talk about David. Talk about Charles Spurgeon. Talk about William Tyndale. Talk about Martin Luther. Talk about Billy Graham. Talk about Reinhard Bonnke. Talk about Benson Dahosa. If you say these people gave tithe so they are wrong, I want to be wrong too. I really, really want to be wrong. Abraham is actually in the hall of faith. He gave tithe. I want to ask for this wrong. I want to be wrong. Amen. Amen. All right. Several reasons to be faithful with your tithe. I've shared this with, with you before. Your tithe is consecrated to God. It belongs to him. Your love for God is expressed in your obedience. So tithing is a matter of obedience. And right now, in this matter, when I talk about tithing, oh yes, the verse 58 is when he says, before Abraham, I am, right? Yeah, before Abraham, I am. Yeah, so, so uh, 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 your tithe, in this case, when I mentioned tithe, I'm just saying it as uh, a term. I have taught you that the tenth, the tenth uh, barrier in the New Testament is removed, 
Are you here? The tenth barrier is removed. It can be a fifth. It can be a tenth. It can be a sixteenth. It can be a twentieth. You have to give it willingly, freely from your heart. So when I mention the tenth year, not necessarily the tenth portion. All right. Whatever you decide, it is. Okay. So your it's an expression of your obedience. Okay. You have command over the spirit of money, mammon. No one can serve two masters. If you are struggling to let go of money, money has control over you. Four, your obedience to release the tenth or the fifth or the seventh, whatever it is, invokes security for the rest. Romans chapter 11 verse 16 says, if the part of the dough offered as first fruit is holy, then the whole bunch is holy. So when we say that if you release this portion, the rest is protected. It's found in Romans 11, 16. There's a principle that says if the portion, if a portion is dedicated to the Lord to be holy, it compels the rest to be holy. This is it. Romans 11, 16. The tithe is a seed, not bread. So you don't eat your seed. Okay? That portion that you're supposed to give, it's a seed. And you sow seeds, you don't eat seeds. Now you help take care of ministry bills such as rent and other mission work. Every offering you give does that. Hallelujah. The last one, any seed sown on a good soil will always yield good fruit. So these are several reasons you should be faithful with your time. So I believe that 10% is a reasonable percentage, not too low, not too much. People, because of the greed of their heart, will be hard to, to give anything above 10, except you have some encounter and a personal revelation. Amen. But the 10th is reasonable. So even in the New Testament, I can still stick to the 10th because I have a freedom from one or just 1% to 100%. I have that freedom. So I can still stay comfortably within the 10th percent. Does that doesn't make sense? Does that make sense? I have the freedom from 1% all the way to giving 100%. All right? And logically, it seems that anything below 10% seems too small to go. Anything be beyond 10% seems too high for my faith. So it looks as though in the wisdom of God, staying within the 10 is just appropriate, whether you are in the old covenant or the new covenant. Does that make sense? Are you blessed tonight? If no questions, we will round up. If no questions, no comments, we will round up. Because we'll be back here at 12 midnight for prayer. Have you learned today? Have you been blessed today? Amen. God bless everybody for joining. Please arm yourself with these scriptures because you would have to give a defense for your stand. 1 Corinthians 9.17 is crucial. 1 Corinthians 9.13 and 14 is crucial. 1 Corinthians 16 is crucial. It is in 16 that Paul says, set money aside. It is in 9, uh, 9 1 Corinthians 9.13 that Paul said Jesus commanded tithing. It is in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 17. He says that we should give. You decide how much to give. So you have the freedom of giving 1% to 100%. So I, as a Christian, the 10% is comfortable for me. It is not challenging my faith or beyond my faith. It is not too small to dishonor my God. So it's just perfect for me. That is my defense for why I tithe. Amen. The Lord bless you all. The Lord keep you. I hope I've been a tremendous blessing to you tonight. I hope that this stays in your heart. I hope that you'll be able to defend these scriptures and your stand and let no man confuse you. Hold on to your faith. The Lord bless you. I'll see you back here tonight. We'll have a, a pastor friend uh, being a blessing to us for uh, the midnight prayer. So please, uh, I'll see you back here. I love you all from the very depth of my heart. May the Lord bless you abundantly so that you will give towards his cause. 
give willingly, freely, abundantly. Love you all. Take care of yourselves. Bye-bye.